Good morning and greetings to you from Zion Lutheran Church here in Crete, Illinois. We pray that in your celebration of this Palm Sunday that you are indeed drawn closer to our Lord Jesus, depending on him, relying on him, trusting in him for today and forever. An interesting fact about Palm Sunday and Jesus' day, it was also the day that God's people would then select and find that spotless male one-year-old lamb that would be sacrificed for the celebration of the Passover. And so we see today, Palm Sunday gives new meaning to that sacrifice that would be made once and for all with God's chosen Son, our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. We open now with the singing of the first hymn, Hymn 130. We continue now and begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God, the Lord our God, of all holiness and righteousness with contrite hearts. Together we now ask him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, 
God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear now the word of Christ from his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our attention is directed now to that word of Christ found for us in the gospel reading for this day, Matthew chapter 21. We hear the details of that first Palm Sunday. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We sing now together the next hymn, hymn 702, Prepare the Royal Highway.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. It all comes to us from God our Father and through his only Son and our only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That word of God to which we focus our attention and by which we pray God's Holy Spirit through this word will feed our faith and empower us to live that faith and to show and share that faith is found in Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is God's word. Let us have a brief prayer. Jesus, may our hearts be burning with more fervent love for you. May our eyes be ever turning to behold your cross anew. Till in glory parted never from the blessed Savior's side. Graven in our heart forever, dwell the cross, the crucified. Amen. Do fellow worshipers of the one and the only who is indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a lot of tradition in this congregation that is connected to Palm Sunday. Some decades ago, it used to be a regular tradition that on this day, those young people that were instructed in the word and give an opportunity to give public testimony of their adherence to that word and doctrine, were then confirmed on Palm Sunday, so that then the first time that they would have the privilege of receiving our Savior's true body and blood in his sacrament would be then during Holy Week on, Palm, on Monday, Thursday. We also know that the sanctuary has frequently been well decorated, even as the altar is now, with palms. Bringing our minds to that first Palm Sunday and being again cognizant and aware of this fact that there were palms that were waved as Jesus came into Jerusalem and also palm branches that were laid in the path of Jesus to carpet the way for Jesus to come into that great city. Yes, to be clear and accurate, Palm Sunday, however, is really not about palms. Palm Sunday is about Jesus. It's about embracing and pondering that commitment on the part of Jesus to resolutely go to Jerusalem, knowing full well, as he so prophesied and told, that he would be betrayed, that he would be captured that he would be tortured, that he would be crucified, and then on the third day rise to life. And yes, this is a day, as we focus on Jesus, we could otherwise refer to this not as Palm Sunday, but as a day, Jesus be praised Sunday. Today, we are emboldened by the very words of Zechariah that impress upon us the Jesus that we all need, who rules with righteousness each one of us all the days of our life until eternity and through eternity. Zechariah proclaimed God's word to a people about 500 years before the birth of Christ at a time where God's people had now had the privilege of coming back into Judah, back to Jerusalem, after experiencing for generations a 70-year captivity that at that time during the captivity was under the rule of the Babylonian Empire. And there, when Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler, he leveled Jerusalem and especially the temple of the Lord. The people have come back hearing probably wonderful stories about Jerusalem because these are generations later of offspring that were in captivity. And when they saw the demolition of the temple, they wept, they cried, they despaired. They were overwhelmed 
to see the ruins of the city. Now Zechariah holds out for them and for us that there is hope on the horizon, real hope, substantial hope. You see, there are promises made in our reading today that have absolute fulfillment on that first Palm Sunday. That King Jesus, he arrives in Jerusalem, as our text says. King Jesus arrives having righteousness. King Jesus arrives holding salvation. King Jesus arrives while sitting on a young donkey. And King Jesus arrives providing real and everlasting peace. It is remarkable. It is truly significant to see that these promises all have absolute fulfillment in Jesus. Among many other Old Testament prophecies, I recently read of there being counted 61 pointed prophecies that point to Jesus and have only fulfillment in Jesus at that particular time in history in reference to that particular person. The mathematical odds of that happening are beyond our comprehension. And so the author goes into a mathematical uh, illustration, I guess you could say. The odds of all those prophecies finding fulfillment in Jesus at that particular time in history would be like a landmass the size of Texas having silver coins spread throughout the entire landmass, two feet high, silver coins, and now having one blind man, or one, I should say, uh, one man who is blindfolded, now walk into that landmass and find the one silver coin that has a red dot on it. We're talking about impossibility here except for the fact that all things are possible with God. And so Jesus is that Savior. He is that promised Savior that we cling to. He is that King of all kings. And Zechariah wants us, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to embrace him, to follow him, to celebrate the fact that we get to be subjects and servants under his rule, and citizens of his kingdom. Consider not only the lowly appearance that Jesus now has, because no doubt, when you think of a, a man riding into a city on a young donkey, it, it doesn't reflect the appearance of a great king. And yet, it's by Jesus' words and his character that we see that his mission, his mission and his purpose is pronounced. And part of that aspect of his ministry is that he is here as a king to give and not to take. Extremely unique. Most often, kings flex their power and influence by taking, not by giving. Evil kings have been there through the annals of history. Evil kings have been known to marry whomever they desire. Evil kings have been known to confiscate and to take other people's property for themselves because they're the king. You think of King Ahab when he stole, as recorded for us in 1 Kings, Naboth's vineyard. Evil kings have been known to amass great armies so as to expand their kingdom and by war and bloodshed to make their mark in history, to rule with an iron fist. Maybe like someone like Adolf Hitler. Evil kings have imposed heavy taxes. Again, taking, taking money, taking taxes in order to build for themselves monuments that would give glory to themselves. And there are numerous examples of that. No, not Jesus. Not King Jesus. He gives good things to all. 
And he gives good things to those who are unworthy of such goodness. And my friends, you and I are those unworthy recipients. You see, we too often have been concerned about our wants. We too often have been guilty of putting ourselves ahead of others. We too often have not feared, loved, and trust in the Lord God above all things. At times, we have been guilty of wanting a different kind of Savior. A different kind of Savior. Not one that rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Not one that looked like and appeared like any other human being. And not one that would allow himself to be so cruelly and unjustly treated and tortured and killed. We too often want a superhero savior. A superhero savior that would ride into Jerusalem on a war horse, a stallion of sorts, with great might and influence. We too often want a savior able to give what we want. Maybe to give us deep pockets that are filled with lots of money. Or too often we want a savior who would rid this world of deadly viruses. But we have the savior we all need. We truly do. He is righteous and holy. He is more concerned about saving us forever than just about saving us for the day or for the week. He is resoundingly clear in his words and actions that rescuing us from Satan and hell is indeed his first priority. We are told in the word of God in Hebrews chapter 2 of how the Lord makes that his priority and mission. For we are told, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That is the kind of king you and I have the wonderful privilege to serve and to worship. A king who became one of us, Emmanuel, God with us, and who is truly righteous, meaning sinless. And that that sinlessness of Jesus is precisely what we lack, yet what God demands, what God expects, what God wants from us. And as hard as we may try, that sinlessness for us, by our doing, by our attitude, by our initiative, is beyond our reach. Solomon writes, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Paul reminds us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the psalmist further reminds us that even if we were to be as good as possible, it would not be enough. Psalm 49, no man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. But Jesus is enough. Jesus is more than enough. And he is precisely what we need. It's what Zechariah needed. And it's what the people to whom Zechariah ministered to also needed. Again, they had returned to that promised land. And you might say, as I mentioned earlier, there was 70 years of captivity. Their nation experienced a 70-year shutdown. How devastating that must have been as they were hundreds of miles away from their homeland, knowing that it was no more. Would God carry through on his promise? Yes, indeed. Our God keeps his promises. 
He keeps all of his promises. And Paul actually reminds us again of that fact and that comfort. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. For so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. The prophecies are fulfilled in Christ. God's promises are sure and certain. And he keeps his promises. As far as God's people in the Old Testament to whom Zechariah was ministering to, we might say that in many respects we feel we are in the same boat. Even now, many of us are filled with dread and fear and uncertainty over the threat of COVID-19. We hear horrifying news of death. Celebrities or known people who we feel would, would have the resources to get beyond this succumb to death. I just was recently reminded that one of the industries that is of some importance or real importance and that the government is seeking to continue to produce is the industry that makes body bags and that the government has requested that there be an additional 100,000 body bags made available. That is troubling news. It hurts. It hits hard. It shakes us up. If you're like me, you relish the days when the biggest concern in my life or for the day was, where did I put my car keys? Or my biggest concern would be the washer and dryer are down until the repairman gets here and now we have to use the coin-op machines at the laundromat. Or when those young children come forward to the day of a game maybe it's baseball or soccer, and say, oh, mom and dad, you're supposed to provide the Gatorade and the treats for after the game today. We relish that those would be the tough things of the day in life, not what's going on right now. Jesus' mission and goal to save us forever raises our awareness that all our earthly problems really do pale in comparison to the hell that we deserve. Even right now, Jesus' mission and goal is to reclaim us and to save us forever as his people. He really wants us to see the bigger picture that goes well beyond the grave. He wants us to see him as the king of kings. He is the king that truly delivers and rescues us. He further wins our love and wants our love by defeating every serious enemy that would seek to condemn us or get between us and our Savior. That's why Jesus came. That's why he is the Savior we need and the King who rules in righteousness. Luther words it well in one of the verses of his great hymn, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. He wrote, the son obeyed his father's will, was born a virgin mother, and God's good purpose to fulfill, he came to be my brother. No garb or pomp or power he wore, a servant's form like mine he bore to lead the devil captive. Jesus' victory remains our victory. And as he rules to bring us that righteousness, to bring us that salvation, he assures us of a lasting peace, a peace that is beyond all human understanding, a peace that was pronounced on the day before Jesus' death when he told his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Jesus came came born for you on Christmas Day. He came into Jerusalem to suffer your suffering, to pay your price for sin, to bear it all on his shoulders. And Jesus will come again, just as he said. These days, we are well familiar with what social distancing is all about. 
And we have to discipline ourselves to practice that. But our God is not distant. Our God is not aloof. Our God is not uncaring. He is here and in your walk, my walk of life. Jesus stayed the course to go to Calvary, and he is with us to help us stay the course that takes us to heaven. In fact, on that same day when Jesus spoke to his disciples before his betrayal, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. He does not leave us, and he will not abandon us. Indeed, he is the Jesus we all need. He is the Jesus we now have, and he rules. In love for you, infinite love, love beyond any comparison, he rules in righteousness for you and forever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to join with me in the confession of faith. And for our confession of faith, we use those words of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocence, suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. We bow our heads in prayer. We come to you, dear Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to ask for your compassion to flow to us. Heal all those who have been infected with this dangerous virus. Strengthen their bodies and immune systems so that they will recover. To those who have been exposed, spare them. May their bodies remain strong so that they will not be overcome by this virus, COVID-19. We pray that those who stay at home be safe and not in any way be infected. We pray for your special protection to all medical staff. Those people who are directly dealing with the patients, protect them at all costs. Sustain them, dear Lord, during these very difficult and demanding situations. 
in Jesus' name, who hears our prayers and answers our prayers in perfect love. Amen. We continue with the response of prayers, and at the beginning will be a special prayer for the family of Norma Thone, who went to be with Jesus yesterday. God of all mercy and compassion, we come to you on behalf of the family of Norma Thone, whom you have called home to yourself yesterday afternoon. We thank you for blessing her so richly in this life, and especially with the wonderful gift of saving faith in her Savior Jesus. We thank you also for making her a rich blessing to her family and your church as well. Comfort her family with that peace and assurance that she is now with Jesus, and we, with saving trust in Jesus, will join her in your time. Keep us all confident in our resurrection, knowing that because Jesus lives, we too will live. Loving Savior, Palm Sunday is a day when we see you worshipped and praised as the King of Righteousness. Indeed, you came as our King and remain our King, even as you set your face toward death and towards the glory that awaited you beyond the cross. You truly came in lowliness so that we would see the real reason for your ministry, that is to be obedient to death, even death on a cross. Through the waving of palm branches, we see you also as the King of Peace. We forever praise you for coming into our world, not to be served, but to serve, and to give your life as a ransom for many. By your willing service, you came to make us dear children of God. Come, King of all grace, rule in us. Lord of all mercy, have mercy on us. Savior of sinners, save us. Now we thank you, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept us this night from all harm and danger. Keep us this day also from sin and every evil, that all our doings and life may please you. Into your hands we commend our body and soul in all things. Let your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. By God's Spirit and in Jesus' name we further pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. With a believing heart in Jesus, receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn, Right On, Right On in Majesty, hymn 133.
Greetings to all of you. Uh, just a few things to uh, share with you, one of which uh, last week, uh, Pastor Schneider let you know that there was a man called to, um, to serve as a first grade teacher, John Schlees, and he has already replied and responded to that divine call and has returned it. Um, therefore, uh, the board of directors will uh, again communicate with one another to issue another call. I would like to let you know that uh, during the course of this week, services will be made available, and uh, uh, the ones that will be live streamed will be uh, Good Friday and Easter 9.30. Uh, a devotional message will be shared by way of internet uh, on Monday, Thursday. And then one added detail that we haven't done yet and are very confident that we can do this, we have the equipment, is on Easter Sunday, a week from today, at 6.30 a.m., we will be able to conduct an outdoor service while everyone remains in their car, and they will listen to the service by way of their FM radio, uh, and that would be on 89.3, is that right? What we had said? Well, you're gonna be getting more information on that. And, uh, but again, it's very important that when we come, this becomes an essential thing also in line with the government uh, and the governor. And so we're allowing and inviting people to bring maybe a non-perishable good to share with the, um, uh, the local pantry. And uh, be careful that you, we all remain in the cars, in the vehicles. Uh, we cannot mingle, but we will take opportunity to hear God's word um, by gathering in the parking lot a week from today at 6.30 for those that are so inclined. God's blessings on your day and your week, and please take opportunity to truly ponder that, that first holy week of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. 